Yeah, I tried. Yeah. So, next up is Brother John Pope. Um, he will be uh, talking this week to us about leading ladies. Today, uh, he'll be discussing the God of Widows, Tamar's story, and Midwife in Israel, great that story. With that, I give you Brother John. Uh, now, uh, someone had asked to dim the lights. Unfortunately, we cannot dim the lights. It's either we dim the lights and can't see John. <laughs> so, uh, or we just keep it as is and um, we, we just adjust. So, thanks so much. Well, thank you for our, for our new improved scene, Scott. <laughs> And good morning to all of you. Good morning. <laughs> Wonderful to be back with you. Uh, I've had the privilege to see a few different communities coming together for the first time. Um, and so I can bring you uh, love and greetings from my brothers and sisters in the Philippine Islands and also in Vietnam, where I've had the privilege to be the last uh, couple of months just as they meet together for the first time. Leading ladies, let's look in depth, in detail, and get to know these heroines, these uh, biblical heroes of the Bible who are female. I haven't presented deliberately a, a study on, on the biblical women before, and part of the reason was, and I've been challenged on this already, because people will say, well, why are you talking about them when you know a woman? That's a, that's a fair enough objection. But the fact of the matter is, uh, most Christian communities are skewed in such a way that most presenters are male. So if the male presenters don't introduce us to the biblical heroines and the, the female presenters don't generally get to speak, then their stories aren't going to be known. And that's a huge loss to us all. So this is a study in which I've learned more than I would normally learn. Every speaker will tell you, well, I've learned a lot from this study and they're telling the truth. But this one, more so than ever before, simply because it's a subject I've left alone out of a sense of deference, like, oh, it's not really my place to talk about a woman's story, which remains true. Uh, but that's left, uh, led me to understand a great number of new things. So, my challenge to myself is, I, however many times you've read your Bible, and I, I know I stand amongst some <coughs> very senior and very experienced Bible students, I hope to be able to share from these studies something new with you and something important uh, about every single female character that we look at. Let's see if we can keep that, that promise. That, that would be fun to do. If you worry about the time, don't worry. There's an actual clock here. That clock is live. You can see it, so you don't need to glance down at your wrist or pull out your phone surreptitiously and try to... Because <laughs> the clock's right there on the screen to keep me accountable and, and to help you keep me accountable too. Enough intro. Let's make a start. The God of Widows, Tamar's story. When the Bible talks about an important principle, the first time that principle shows up, it often appears in, in a form where it's going to resonate, the lesson's going to resonate uh, for a long time further forward. And Tamar is the first widow that we meet in the Bible. Genesis 38 is her story, and it's a brutal read. Let's just talk through it very quickly to hit the highlights. She's married to Judah, the head of the tribe, Judah. She's married to Judah's firstborn son, Ur. We don't know what was wrong with Ur, but he was wicked, and God killed him. Such was his wickedness. Uh, and so, then, as a widow, she has no income, she would starve to death, there's no social security system. So God's law provides for that by, by the, the law of what's known as leveret marriage. And what that means is, a younger son is then uh, morally obliged to marry his older brother's widow, and provide for her as if, uh, as if she were her own wife, in fact, to be her own wife. Um, the catch is, or the, the disadvantage for the, for the younger brother, is the first son that they have will be named after the dead brother and will take the dead brother's inheritance. So it's a wonderful opportunity for that younger brother. He has the power to bring his older brother back to life through the son that they have. But that son will then take all the inheritance of the older brother. So what happened when Ur died, Onan, the younger brother, married uh, Tamar and said, 
but I don't want to have children with her, because if I have children with her, I'm going to lose all my older brother's money, which currently is coming to me. And that was a very wicked thing. So he refused to, to impregnate Tamar. And that was wicked in God's sight. It was wicked because what Onan's been given is the chance to perform resurrection. He's been given the chance to be Jesus. And he says, no, I'd rather take the money. <laughs> right? And literally, that's, that's, that's what he's saying. And God says, okay, you serve me or you serve mammon? You chose mammon? Okay, well, that's, that's the road to death. So you died too. So now Ur is dead, and Onan is dead, and Tamar is a widow for the second time. And there's one more son, Shelah. And Judas, Judah says, oh, well, Shelah's too young to marry at the moment. You have to wait a bit. Now, he's lying. He has no intention of letting Tamar marry Sheila at any time. I don't know why, I suspect he's afraid that Tamar is somehow causing the death of his son, so he's only got one left. And so he actually sends Tamar home. He says, you go back and live with your family, go back and live with your own father. You don't even live in my house anymore. So he won't take care of her, he doesn't provide for her, and he won't allow his last son to marry her. So she is stuck. She is going to outlive her father, logically, at which point, she will starve to death. And she is living in her father's house uh, for many years. Ur's wickedness prevents Tamar from having a son. Onan, the, the second brother, refuses to raise a son for the widow. Judah refuses to give his last third son to Tamar. She has nothing, and she is sent home. And she is at home with her father for years and years and years. Time passed. She realizes she's just staring at a death sentence. She's got nothing. What we're going to see in this, this little talk on Tamar is how clever she is that from this desperate situation, she gets her way out of it. Man doesn't care for widows, is what we learn. The widow is a crisis situation. Onan could have taken care of her, refused to. Sheila could have taken care of her, refused to. Judah could have provided Sheila, refused to. And so she's in trouble. And here's then what she plans to do. She has to somehow get a hold over Judah so that she can uh, manipulate him or have power over him uh, to get the husband she needs to stay alive. So she poses as a prostitute by the roadside. She took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance to Inam, which is on the road to Timnah. Now she's planned this for years. Let's have a look at those little details. Inam is the place she was. Well, what's, what's that about? It's a word that means twin wells. Now there's only one well in this photograph, so what I've done for you very cleverly is I've got another one right over here. <laughs> uh, so you don't think I don't, I don't think what you mean. And so now we have twin wells, which is marvelous. So here she is at a nam. Why there? I wonder why she chose that spot. She could have gone directly to Timnah, which is where Judah was headed. It means twin wells. What do you know about marriage and wells? Real question, come on, what's, what's the precedent we understand? What happened at a well to do with marriage? There were several women at the well that God said. Excellent, Suzanne. The patriarchs, this is their history, right? Isaac and Jacob both met their wives at a well. Uh, Isaac's story is here in Genesis 24, and Jacob's story is here in Genesis 29. We won't go and dive into them, but nor we dive into the well. But they, that's where they met their wives, at a well. How many, how many husbands does Tamar have? Two. Two wells, two husbands, twin wells, and then she sat there at two wells saying, but I don't have a husband. Maybe it's a pointed little remark to Judah saying, you've given me two husbands, and they were both terrible in God's eyes. God killed them. And here I am without a husband. I'm at the well again. What are you going to do for me? Are you going to help me? The law says you can give me your son, but you don't want me to. And so I'm going to starve to death because you refuse to follow the law. Is Tamar saying by picking out Enam that he's given her two husbands already that were absolutely useless, they were wicked in the sight of God. And so she has to come back to the well a third time. Possibly, that's speculation. But these little details are important. We need to read the Bible slowly and absorb what's being said. That's just a little speculation from me. But I, I think Tamar has planned this very carefully. In fact, we're going to prove that. And so that might be why she picked a name at which to meet him. 
When Judas saw Tamar, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face with that veil. And Tamar said, What will you give me as a, as a price for this prostitution? And he said, I will send you a young goat from the flock. So there's two components to Tamar's deception now. The veil that she's used to cover her face, a garment, and a goat. Tamar fools Judah with a goat and a garment. Coincidence? A goat and a garment. Who's been fooling people with a goat and a garment? Judah. Sorry? Judah. I don't, Judah. I don't know who said that, but whoever it was, well done. Oh, all the way back there. Yes, that's right. In fact, and I won't go off on a rant about this, chapter breaks are a hazard. They were introduced into the Bible by a, an arrogant Englishman. There was only one Englishman who was ever arrogant, by the way, so that's how you know it. Too. In the 13th century, and it was a disaster. Whenever you hit a chapter break, what that chapter break tells you is stop reading. Who told you to stop reading? Keep going. Maybe you shouldn't have started the chapter break. Chapter breaks will destroy your understanding of the Bible. And what we know as Genesis 38 is preceded by Genesis 37. And in Genesis 37, right at the bottom there, which would have stuck on to tame our story if that silly Englishman hadn't put a break in there, is Judah deceiving his father with a goat and a garment. What's the details? What's, what's he doing? It's not the birthright one, but, but we're actually going to come to that. You're ahead of it. You're ahead of it again. You're five minutes ahead. Judah is trying to convince Jacob that Joseph is dead. Remember, so he takes Joseph's coat of many colors, the garment, and he dips it in blood, the blood of a kid goat, and says, look, look, Dad, oops, I think, I think your son's dead. Right? Fools him with a goat and a garment. Judah deceived his father Jacob with a goat and a garment. Who else performed deception with a goat used as a garment? Jacob, well, he, yeah, Jacob, <laughs> not Esau, Esau was the innocent one in this case. Yeah, Jacob dressed up pretending to be Esau, because Esau was hairy. So Jacob takes a kid goat and he puts the skin on his arms, on his neck, remember, to fool his own father. His own father is blind by this point. Nice work, Jacob. Good man. Jacob deceives his father Isaac with a goat and a garment. You see? The father is a deceiver with a goat and a garment who gives birth to a son who is a deceiver with a goat and a garment. This is all family history, Tamar knows. She's a clever, thoughtful woman. She says, I'm going to fool you, Judah, and I know exactly how I'm going to do it. I'm going to use your family tradition of deception. Deception begets deception begets deception. Tamar deceives Judah the deceiver, son of Jacob the deceiver, and with the same tools. That's not a coincidence. That's beautiful. That's powerful. That's the kind of thing I would want him to have learned in Sunday school. Right? The Sunday school teachers in the room, tell this to the children. This is the true depth of Tamar's understanding of what's been going on and how to apply it and how to convince a man who's behaving in an ungodly man to become godly. She's a powerful, clever woman. She's a leading lady. What pledge shall I give you, therefore? What's my down payment, if you like, says Judah? And Tamar says, well, give me your signet and your cord and the staff that is in your hand. The signet is a ring, and it's literally his signature. So when he signs parchments, he dips it in, uh, not ink, he dips it in uh, wax and, and stamps his name. So she's taken away his signature and his staff. That's his legal identity, his signature, and also his staff. What does the staff mean? The staff is a sign of authority. You look at verses like this. The scepter won't depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. All I'm showing you that verse for is to, is to show you that the staff is a symbol of a ruler, of a leader. It's not just a stick that you lean on to walk, okay? So Judah, so Tamar has taken away his legal identity and his authority. Judah has refused to let Tamar become a wife for the third time. He's deprived her of any social authority, and he's deprived her of any legal identity within Israel. So what has Tamar taken away? Tamar takes from Judah what Judah had taken from her. She knows what she's doing. She's 
thought this through. And after the event of prostitution with Judah and Tamar, Tamar conceives. She's pregnant. She becomes pregnant from Judah's sin. It's Judah's sin. And yet, what does Judah do? Judah says, oh good, let's kill her then. Bring her out and let her be burned. Now there is a number of problems with that statement. Uh, the department, not just it's horrific. It's completely illegal by God's law. Because Judah is saying, well, let's not have a trial. Let's not have any witnesses. Let's not have any evidence. Let's start with the death sentence and maybe work backwards from there. Let's just kill her and be done. And also, what's this burning? God never permitted anyone to be burned to death under any circumstances. Some criminals were considered so heinous that after they had been killed, their bodies were burned, so they weren't given a legacy of a gravestone or, or a tomb. But that Judas' sentence is both illegal by Jewish law, by God's law, and immoral. No trial, no evidence, just a death sentence. So at this point, Tamar has to move very quickly now. Her life is about to end probably that same day. So it's time for her to unmask Judah the deceiver. And so she brings forward the signet ring and the star and says, well, please examine or please identify whose these are. So this is the man that I slept with. This is the man who impregnated me, the owner of these two things. Please identify whose they are, the signet and the cord. And it's a rare word used here, this, this Hebrew word, hachana. It's not just have a look at this. It's like almost forensically examine this. Cause an identity to be, to, to be derived from these things. And there's, a, again, a lovely irony taken away from you by a chapter break. Because Judah has said to Jacob, in what's theoretically a different chapter, this robe we have found, look, here's Joseph's coat of many colors. Please identify Jacob, whether it's Joseph's robe or, or whether it isn't. And he's using exactly the same word. Now this, this symmetry may have been created by God, the author of the Bible, rather than intentionally by Tamar, we can't be sure. But this is the same verb, a rare verb. Please examine. And what's so ironic is that the evidence that Tamar's bringing forward is true evidence of Judah's immorality. It really is his signature ring and his staff that proves he is the father of this illegitimate child. And yet she's using this verb to identify the true evidence of his immorality. And yet when he uses the same word, he's using it to his father to present fake evidence. He knows full well that's not Joseph's blood on the road. He put the goat's blood on the road. He knows he's presenting fake evidence to his father saying, please identify this robe and see whether it's your son's robe or not. So the final irony, that when they both use the same verb to cause for a forensic identification of evidence, one of them knows he's presenting fake evidence. The other, our leading lady, knows that she's presenting true evidence of Judah's further sin. So Judah has sin upon sin upon sin here. It's about time. He finally comes out and says, you know, all right, hands up, you got me. She is more righteous than I. I have misbehaved this whole time. It's a bit late in the day, but at least Judah finally confesses. And the only reason he confesses is because Tamar has outmaneuvered him. Doubtless God may have operated, for sure. But Tamar has outmaneuvered him. Tamar has managed to save herself with considerable pre-planned cunning. But to some extent the damage is done because she's now and her family banned from the, from the Lord's assembly for ten generations because of uh, the uh, illegitimate child. God, however, is never far from her. God is the God of widows. David writes, Father of the fatherless is God and protector of widows is God in his holy habitation. And let's look how that was actually true in a very practical sense. God gave laws to ensure in time past that widows were cared for. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheep in the field, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the immigrant. Leave it for the orphan. Leave it for the widow. Now that's the law from many, many years ago. But let me show you a verse from Jeremiah 
which also Jeremiah might be thought to be a long time ago, 700 BC or whatever, this verse still applies today. You can see that it does if you read it. What Jeremiah says, God is speaking, if you do not oppress the immigrant, the orphan, or the widow, then I will let you dwell in this place, Israel, in the land that I gave of old to your fathers forever. Now, who in this room would like to dwell in Israel, spiritually speaking, forever? That's what the kingdom is, right? Dwelling in Israel forever. So this is actually a condition of the kingdom of God. Let's read this verse one more time, the other way round. If you do oppress the immigrant, if you do oppress the orphan or the widow, then I will not let you dwell in Israel forever. What a lesson for the modern Christian. You want to dwell in Israel forever? Do not oppress the immigrant. Do not oppress the orphan. Do not oppress the widow. That's a condition that we have, albeit said many years ago, as relevant now as it ever was then. That would seem to be the end of Tamar's story, but for one remarkable detail, a very strange story. We've just said she was impregnated by Judah, so that in fact has twins. And the birth of the twins is told to us because of very weird things happen during the birth. Let's just read it. When Tamar was in labor with the twins, one of them put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet cord on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But then he drew back his hand, and his brother fully came out and was born. And she said, what a breakout you have made for yourself. Therefore his name was called Breakout, which in Hebrew is Perez. And afterwards his brother came out with the scarlet cord on his hand, and his name was called Scarlet, Zero. So scarlet is the rightful firstborn in human terms, but God allows the child called Breakout, the second one, to displace scarlet. And in fact, God chooses Perez, the second son, to host the line of Messiah, not scarlet, the first son. And you might think, goodness me, why are we told all these weird and wonderful details? And see, this is where I start with Bible study. Where are the details that I didn't need to know? I don't need to know this. I mean, sure, if that happened in my family history, it would be a nice piece of family law. But there's no spiritual value obviously lying in those verses. It's a weird detail after detail after detail. It's like, well, this sounds very painful for Tamar as well. I'm getting out of this. This sounds like chaos. Right? His kids are up to goodness knows what. That's all I get from it. Now, there's got to be more in it than that. And that's where I say, okay, here's where we need to start Bible study. That's a whole bunch of details that seem to have no spiritual value, but God insists that I know about them. And that's where I would recommend to you, if you want to know where to start Bible study, take verses like these. And I think, wait a minute, because I ask myself, why do I need to know any of this? Wait. There's a scarlet cord. Where do I know about a scarlet cord? You see, what is the answer? What is this trying to teach us? Here's the most bizarre answer you've seen today. It tells us who Rahab is. It's a very weird answer and requires much explanation, which we'll get hopefully. It also tells us about how God sees his people Israel being born, which is an even weirder answer. So I understand it, it all sounds very confusing. But that's what these verses are for. I haven't shown you how, so we need to know for that we would need to explore Rahab's story, in which case, let's do it right now. Let's get right into Rahab's story, because that's what that epilogue of Tamar's story is for. It's to give us a link to Rahab's story and help us understand who Rahab is. Let's see how that works. Israel, at the time of Joshua chapter 2, are as yet unborn in their land, if you like. They're a traveling homeless people. They've left Egypt, so they're no longer slaves. They're no longer indentured slaves in the land of Egypt. They're wandering through the wilderness, and they're supposed to be going to a promised land. They've actually arrived at the gates of the promised land 40 years before, where their parents had a complete breakdown of faith and courage and ran away, essentially, and God said, you generation are useless. You'll need to die in the desert. 
I will work with your children. These are now those children. Jericho is going to be their very first battle in the land. And they're led now by Joshua, not Moses. Joshua is one of only two survivors from the previous generation that God uh, didn't curse. And Joshua sends spies into Jericho to spy out the military defenses, to spy out the land. Makes sense. He was once a spy. He'd been sent as a spy into the land uh, under Moses. And so he knows the value of espionage intelligence. At this point, the spies come into Jericho and they meet Rahab. They go and stay at a prostitute's house. Now from our vantage point, we might say, wow, that's a little bit distasteful, that's all very ungodly. What are they doing that for? Well, lives are on the line. This is a real life story. Lives are on the line and one of the most intelligent places to hide out, there's two foreigners in a city, would to be to hide out in a prostitute's house. One of the few places that would house foreigners overnight. So whether or not we like it, that's what they chose, and it was a wise choice, uh, whether or not we have moral problems with it. So the spies hide out in Rahab the prostitute's house. Rahab's house is on the city wall. The walls of the city are broad enough that they actually have uh, buildings built on them. This is a common thing through many generations. These is, this photograph actually comes from uh, northern Italy, where you can still see some houses today that are built on the city walls. Rahab's had one similar such, and of course you have windows, you have apertures in the house, that means you can actually escape the guards, because you can actually get out of the city and technically into the city without ever having to go through the city gate. And Rahab's house is on this broad city wall. Now the king finds out that the spies have stayed with uh, Rahab, and he questions her. But Rahab hides the spies in some foliage and some plants laid out on the roof, and deceives the king. Right away, Rahab shows her courage. She's in Jericho. Jericho is a fortified city. There's no sign whatsoever that this city is going to fall, and she has been caught hiding uh, two spies. But Rahab immediately chooses her allegiance. I choose the allegiance of Israel's God. I will defend these two defenseless little spies and keep them from being tortured and killed from the king of Jericho. I choose my allegiance right away. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, bring forth the men that have come to you. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she lies to the king. She says, oh, you, you just missed them. Sorry, they, they slipped out just before the gates closed and went, oh, I don't know, that away. Why don't you send some men out? Off you go, good luck. So she has no problem at all in having the courage to look the king of Jericho in the face and tell him a big flat lie. Where have we heard that story before? Where's that echoing? The midwives. Which, which midwives, all that? Excellent. Rahab hides the spies, resists the king, deceives the king. We've seen that before. Remember? Uh, Walter remembers, the midwives were told by Pharaoh, the Hebrew midwives were told, kill the babies, kill the male babies of Israel. When you arrive and attend the birth, you can let the girls live, but the men, the male babies, you should kill them. When you serve as a midwife for the Hebrew woman, see them on the birth stool, if it's a son, kill him. But if it's a daughter, let her live. But the midwives chose allegiance with Israel's God, and they feared God, and they did not fear the king of Egypt. So they resisted him, disobeyed him, and lied to him. Because he called them in and said, well, hey, what's going on? There's a lot of male babies still, still living. And they said, well, it's not our fault. By the time we arrive, these Hebrew women, they get birth so quickly, we show up, the kids are already gone. Which is, you know, pedaled off on a trike, if you mean. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, it's not the best cover story I've ever heard in my life, but you know. The point is they were courageous. The point is that they resisted the king. The midwives hid the babies, resisted the king, and deceived the king. So straight away we see Rahab appears in the midwife role. The spies, interestingly, appear in the role of helpless babies, which is valid, I guess, when you're only two men uh, in an enemy city. So hiding the, hiding the babies, resisting the king, deceiving the king, Rahab plays the same role as did the midwives of Moses' day. Interesting comparison. Rahab shows her, and what Rahab does for the spies is massively important. Because we know the end from the beginning, perhaps we don't 
appreciate the importance of what Rahab said. But the spies are coming to, into Jericho knowing nothing. What are the military defenses? What's going on? Where, where are the, where's the power built up? And Rahab says, just to paraphrase this, she says, everyone is already terrified of you. That is the best piece of military information you can possibly receive. They didn't know that. They've been told, everyone is already terrified. They're afraid to fight you. So this is a fantastic piece of intelligence to take back to Joshua, to take back to the Israelites, particularly in the context of 40 years earlier, the reason the Israelites didn't fight is because they were afraid. They're busy being afraid of each other. And Rahab's able to reassure that as soon as we heard the destruction of Sihon and Og, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. That's a stronger faith than you'll find in the Israelite army. And it's held by a Canaanite prostitute. This is a leading lady. It's vital encouragement for Israel to fight against Jericho. And this is how Rahab helps Israel emerge, be born, may I say, into the land of Israel, the land that was promised to them. And Rahab requests mercy. She knows Israel will win the war, so she requests mercy from the spies to whom she has already shown mercy. Well, we're going to borrow from the, uh, from the Hebrew word here, hesed, is what she's asking for. She says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly hesed with you, please also deal kindly hesed with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. Do you notice who is missing from that list? On the screen in front of you. Husband. Husband. <laughs> Husband. That's, a, that's a clever one. I never thought of that. Well, I'm assuming Rahab is not married. First of all, the, the husband may have a difficulty with the day job. Yes. And it's actually listed, the building they're in is listed as Rahab's house. Whereas it would be, you know, Bill's house or whatever, if, if she had a husband thus called. So I'm assuming Rahab doesn't have a, a husband, but I did hear an excellent answer from the front row here. The person missing from the list is Rahab. Look, she doesn't even mention herself. Save father and mother, save brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. You might say, well, she just, by implication, she says, our their lives. So she includes herself at the very end by implication. She is more focused on the salvation of those that she loves than on saving her own life. If you want to know how to be godly, then you need to meet leading Lady Rahab. Be more focused on saving the lives of those that you love, even than yourself. She only mentions herself by implication at the end of her request. This is, this is the magnitude of the person we meet in Rahab. Uh, but there's a problem. You see, Rahab can't be saved. Why can't Rahab be saved? Because God said so. God said, kill them all. But in the cities of these peoples, the Lord your God is giving you for inheritance. You shall save alive nothing that breathes. You shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, that includes Rahab, and the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded. And the language there is interesting. I don't read Hebrew, I don't pretend to be a Hebrew expert because I'm not. But the language is interesting. What you see there in English is the phrase, you shall devote them to complete destruction. That's actually a very nice, decorous phrase. What the Hebrew says, is one word three times over. Haram, haram, haram. So what reads as a nice sentence in English is actually God, in a rare moment really, banging on the podium saying, destroy, destroy, destroy. That's all it says. And, and some, some nice translators got, you shall devote them to complete destruction and have beautiful English. Sword in one hand, cup of tea in the other. Complete destruction. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, that's not what God says. God just shouted the word Haram three times. Kill, 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 is what he's saying. This is a severe 
uh, severe pronouncement. So no one's to be spared, which means if no one's to be spared, to state the obvious, Rahab is not to be spared. This is God's law. Who will violate God's law? Maybe, maybe God isn't serious about harm? Oh, not so. You see, there's a man called Achan in the, in the battle that will follow. He'll choose to violate harm too. And so he steals some of the things, some gold coins and a pretty blanket or, or something like that. And he steals some of the helem. If you're confused, this is the verb to destroy, harm. And these are the things that are supposed to be destroyed, the helem. And God is angered by the fact that Achan has broken the law of harm. And he says, Israel sinned. They've transgressed my covenant, my command of them. They have taken some of the harem, devoted things. They've stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel themselves have become harem to me. And I, God, will be with you no more unless you destroy the harem from among you. And the sequence of justice proceeds. Achan is found and Achan is destroyed. And all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them, Achan and Achan's wife, and uh, Achan's children, uh, were stoned with stones to death, and their bodies were burned with fire. No one is to be spared, not even Rahab. So Rahab cannot be spared. Now we already know the end of the story, so it's like, well, that doesn't work. So how, how are the spies allowed to break God's law when Achan wasn't? Rahab actually knows about this. Rahab knows about the law of harm because she references it. She says, we've heard what you did to the two kings of the Amorites on the eastern side of the Jordan, Sion and Og, whom you harm. I understand this religious law of destruction. I understand. I saw it happen. Nevertheless, she still requested mercy, and she still received mercy. And the spies said, if you do not tell us this business, if you do not tell, if you do not leak this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the man, we will deal kindly, chesed, and faithfully with you. How did Rahab know that she could be spared when she knew the law that nothing could be spared? It's not an obvious question, is it? But the answer is beautiful. Because she knew Israel's God. See, Achan stole. He stole things he wanted. He wanted the gold. He wanted the pretty blanket. But Rahab knew that for Israel's God, Hesed always trumps Helen. Mercy always beats judgment. Rahab doesn't steal from God, but she makes requests to God. And here's our entire discipleship in one slide. You stand before God and says, I know what I deserve. I am Haem. But please, you are a loving God. Will you not save me? And that's what Rahab did. And there's no point in doing that if God doesn't listen. The point is God does listen. So Rahab knew what so many didn't, that have said trumps Haem. And she requests the mercy and can receive exemption from the law of Haman, even when it was a very sweeping and powerful law. And what does she do? She takes the, uh, Rahab brought the spies up to the roof and she hid them with the stalks of flax that she'd laid out on the roof. And she hid these two men uh, in the plant life, just like there's actually three men hiding in the picture you're looking at, if you can see them, because they're camouflaged quite well. Um, and she hides them amongst the plant life on the roof. Now this word, is uh, common in some sense, but in this particular configuration, it's only used twice in the whole Bible. And what's interesting is you see the word them there, plural, because there's two spies. That's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says that she hit him, which is one, which is weird. And every single translator says, oh, it's a mistake. There's two spies, so obviously we should write them. And they do, but fair enough, I guess. But it really says she hit him. And only by saying hit him does it perfectly match the only other time that it's used in the whole Bible, when Jochebed could hide Moses no longer. She got a papyrus basket for him and put it among the reeds on the banks of the river, hidden among the plants, hidden among the plants. And who is Jochebed to Moses? 
mother run out of money and they need? Okay, it was the mother, but what, what was she hired as? Nurse. nurse. Try a different word for nurse, I like it though. Midwife. Yes, she was his mother, though. But because Miriam was hiding by the riverbank and watching what was going on, and Pharaoh's daughter said, I need a midwife for this baby. And, and Miriam says, I know. We're the Jewish people. We're smart enough. I'll, I'll, get, my mother, I'll get my mother to be actually paid to be a mother to this, uh, this baby. So Jochebed is actually hired as the midwife. So Jochebed, yes, it is the mother. You're absolutely right. The mother and the midwife. When the midwife, the midwife hid the baby among the plants. Rahab hid the spies or him among the plants. So again, it's a nice little match, isn't it? Jochebed became Moses' midwife, therefore the implication is, it's a second implication, an independent one, that Rahab was Israel's midwife. That's a very tenuous one. Based on one word, for goodness sake, let's not go crazy. But it's a nice little match, it's a nice little pattern nonetheless. Now let's look at some real powerful evidence. This is fun. This is, this is a fun discovery. I, I hope you'll enjoy it. It's not been presented anywhere before, so uh, you'll see this. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the people the second time. The whole generation were not circumcised because their parents had given up on God, given up on the law, they didn't even circumcise the kids. Right? So this whole fighting generation, uh, is, and God says, this is the time, circumcise them now. Now speaking as a human, not necessarily someone following God, this is the worst possible time. They haven't fought the Battle of Jericho yet. Let's imagine I'm the commander of the armed forces. Here are my armed forces. We're going to go into battle. Oh, I know. Why don't I perform a surgical operation on all of you that will cripple you for days at a time and keep you weak forever? That's a good time. This is the worst possible time to circumcise them. It's almost like God knows better than man. Because he says, no, no, no. This is the right time. When is it? We're told the exact date. Did you know that? How weird. It's the tenth of Abib, we're told. They crossed the Jordan and they were circumcised right on that, on that time. Now, another Bible test. Israeli male baby should be circumcised. When? Eight days. Leviticus 12, verse 3. Good job. God told command circumcision on the eighth day. So that's the eighth day. The eighth day since what? The eighth day since God sees his nation of Israel as being born. Now these are all grown men of all sorts of different ages, right? The whole army. But he says, you were all born on one day. But today's the eighth day. So now, today, you must all be circumcised. So, here's the fun trick. Or the exercise on trick. If we go back seven days, we get to see the day that God considers his nation was born. If God keeps his own law, and I assume he's consistent with his own law, and if so, that's the eighth day, right? That, that must be day number eight when they're circumcised. And, and I was speaking with, with Wilson, and he was saying, you know, the bad news of trying to find a timeline in scripture is you usually never can. Because it's always like, oh, well, sometime later this happens, and a while after it's like, ah, oh, you, know, you lose the exactitude. How brilliant is this particular part of the Bible? Every day is spelled out. Almost as if it left it open for you to be able to do this. We can do this. Look. Count back seven days. We find the day that God considers when Israel was born. They crossed the Jordan, yes. But before they crossed the Jordan, it tells us explicitly they camped three days at the Jordan on the other bank, the eastern bank, before they crossed over. So those were days seven, six, and five. Okay. What happened before that? It tells us exactly. They went to camp at the Jordan immediately after they heard from the spies. But the spies had been, those two spies, they had been hiding for three days in the hills after they left Rahab. So those are days four, three, and two. So the day that Israel was born was the day before day two. I'm glad we're counting backwards. <laughs> That's the day they met Rahab. They met Rahab, the spies met Rahab, they left her, they camped three days, one, two, three, in the hills, came down, spoke to Joshua, Joshua said, okay, here we go, we're going to now camp at the Jordan, days five, six, seven. Then they crossed the uh, Jordan, and God said, 
now be circumcised. This is day eight. So God sees the birth of his nation not as the day they crossed the Jordan. That's clearly a baptismal scene. And we often take baptism, or we take the crossing of the Jordan to be a synonym with baptism, that's fair. And we often say that baptism is the day that you're born. Well, that's wrong, right? If the baptism is the day you're born, then we would baptize infants. Why wouldn't we? The whole reason we don't baptize infants is like, no, there are lots of things have to happen before you get baptized. Right? Baptism is like the wedding day. That's the day you enter covenant. Right? The day that you got married, for those of you who are married, the day you got married was not the first day of that relationship. I hope it wasn't. It would be quite a gamble if it was. I mean, good luck to you and everything. But, you know, that's not the first day of the relationship, I assume. This is the birthday. So if God sees Israel's birth as the day that Rahab ministered them, how much more strongly is the point made that Rahab was the midwife to their birth? The midwife chosen by God. The eight days are even plotted out for you in all the Bible references. You can go and look at them for yourself at your leisure, and you'll find that holds up. And there's one more thing. Well, how much time have we got? Six o'clock. Oh, I've got three minutes. That's all I need. There's one more thing. Memory. What is it we were supposed to remember that was going to help us understand Rahab? Cord. Scarlet cord. Tamar's midwife. Tamar's midwife, not Tamar. Tamar's midwife tied the scarlet cord around the human firstborn, but God chose the second son for Messiah's line. Okay, how is that going to help us? Because Rahab tied the scarlet cord on Canaanite Jericho. And now we know why. She did it because she was told to, I realize that. The scarlet cord is tied on the firstborn, tied by the midwife. So in Tamar's case, it was tied on Zero, the kid they called Scarlet, tied by Tamar's midwife. And in Rahab's case, it was tied on Canaanite Jericho, and it was tied there by Rahab. Once again, Rahab is in the midwife role. The second son broke out got out first, ahead of the firstborn. In Tamar's case, that was the one they called Breaker, Peretz, in Hebrew. And in Rahab's case, who broke into Jericho and took it over? God's people Israel. And God chose the Breakout son to host the line of his Messiah. It wasn't Zerah, it was Peretz who hosted the line of Christ, and it wasn't Canaan, it was Israel who hosted the line of Christ. Tamar's birth example, which was that very weird set of verses, actually teaches us. God says, I'm going to do that with my people. This isn't just chaos going on in the promised land. The scarlet cord is God's exceptional authorization for a people to displace the firstborn. Just as Perez displaced Zira, so Israel is authorized to take the promised land and to displace the people who came before them. And the scarlet cord is the symbol of that. And if we'd been paying close attention to what had happened in the life of Tamar, we'd have known that immediately when we saw Rahab tie that cord on. These are the things I wish I had learned in Sunday school. So let's just summarize what we have. The Hebrew midwives resisted and deceived the king of Egypt. Rahab resisted and deceived the king of Jericho. Jochebed, the midwife, hid Moses and the plants in the river. Rahab hides the spies, the Israelite babies, if you will, in on the roof. The law calls them Israelite male to be circumcised eight days after the midwife delivered him. God calls Israel to be circumcised eight days after Rahab saved the lives of the spies. Tamar's midwife ties the scarlet cord on firstborn Zira. Rahab ties the scarlet cord on Canaanite Jericho. How much evidence do we need? I lament going past the age of 50 before ever spotting this. It's rather obvious on reflection. Rahab is Israel's midwife. The four things that she does in her story are all mirrors of what a midwife has done before. In fact, I don't think there are any other midwives in the Bible prior to, to Joshua chapter 2. And Rahab has essentially recapitulated the lives of all of them. So God is speaking as loudly as he can for those who are prepared to, to dig into the details and, and see. Rahab 
as Israel's midwife. Who is Rahab? And I can ask that question. Who is Rahab? And I always get the same answer. She's a prostitute. Well, okay. True. She is a Canaanite prostitute. If we use earthly eyes, we will only ever see earthly things. And in earthly terms, Rahab was a prostitute. But if we use heavenly eyes, and look at the Bible the way that we're supposed to, and look at the Bible the way that we're provoked to, as it is written, surely then we will see heavenly things. Rahab is a leading lady. She is God's chosen midwife to birth his people Israel. So here's the final lesson. When someone asks you, who is Rahab? Realize the answer that you give is going to tell them who you are. Not who Rahab is. Anyone tells me, Rahab's a prostitute. I'm like, yeah, okay, so I know who you are. I know what eyes you have. Someone tells me, Rahab is God's chosen midwife. I know who you are. I know what eyes you use. And that's the education I get from this leading lady.